Welcome to r slash Tales from Tech Support, where we get to have a little chuckle at the technologically disadvantaged, like me. I'm Uncle Reddit, and have I got a story for you. Well, hey guys, happy Monday. Since there's no cats around me again, this will be a perfect time to introduce Shenya. Shenya is a, was a guinea pig. Uh, sadly, she's no longer with us, but her helper sent me an email with a bunch of pictures, and her helper, and I'm going to mangle this, Shawandra, I'm, I'm guessing that's how it's pronounced. I'm sorry. Anyway, she uh, she wrote me a little small blurb about Shenya, her uh, her special needs guinea pig. I got her as a very small baby. She was very sick, dying actually. And a friend of mine who worked in a pet shop asked if I would take her as she wouldn't make it through the weekend. It was a Friday. Shenya had a fungus over most of her body, a damaged eye and ear problems that later caused her to go deaf. Teeth problems, was apathetic, etc. She was also just skin and bones and much too small. After a few rough months, she got better. We were inseparable. She always wanted to be around me and not around my other guinea pigs. I had five others at the time. We were like that until she died at age seven last June. Sorry for your loss. She was special needs all her life and needed a lot more care. Also, many more visits to the vet as she had teeth, eye, and general health issues all her life. Guinea pigs usually reach ages between five and eight, so she left as an old grumpy grandma. In the last two weeks of her life, she lost the ability to walk with her hind legs, so I got her a wheelchair. I added a picture of that, but she didn't like the chair. Yeah, I find that most small animals really dislike little wheelchairs and things like that. I don't know if it's just because they're not used to it. She may, if she was younger, have gotten used to it, but yeah, at that age, you know, they're like, eh, they're used to just being the way they were. Really cute, though. So, we'll have Shenya up here on the screen for the rest of the video, and, uh, Thanks for sharing, Chandra. <laughs> Let me know if I screwed that up. Shoot me an email. I'm pretty sure I did. Let's read some stories. How to type a phone number. One from a colleague of mine who looks after support for our telephone and conference equipment. User calls and says they can't dial into a phone conference call because their phone doesn't have the correct button on it. They explain they can dial the general conference number, but they can't enter the five-digit code to connect them to their specific conference call. Colleague has very occasionally had similar things before with British versus U.S. English and people getting confused when asked to press pound, which can be called a pound or a hash key, but it's not that. So colleague asks them for the number and permission to connect as a test. User agrees. Colleague connects without issue. Colleague is puzzled and asks user to go through it again step by step with them saying what button they're pressing as they're pressing it. So colleague can work out how they can possibly screw this up. Check the logs. Everything's okay until user gets to the five digit code, which has a nice sequence, seven, eight, nine, 10. Easy to remember, easy to type. However, user explains that their phone keypad only goes from zero to nine and they don't have a 10 key. Kali goes on mute for a few seconds and once they've stopped laughing, they diplomatically suggest someone may have given them an incorrect code and to try one zero, not 10. User thanks him and goes away happy, still not realizing what happened. I'm pretty sure at some point somebody filled him in on it. Uh, amazing. They don't have a 10 key. I mean, we've been dialing phone numbers for ages. Even in third world countries, people know how to dial a phone number. Oh, well. When users are even outplayed by a bunch of cables. I work in in-house IT in a medical research institute in Germany. Not much to tell, but it's one of those stories every new IT employee here gets to hear. You would think that people here would have some basic understanding of computers and machines, but this one user, let's call him Martin, was a bit untalented with computers. I can understand that someone doesn't know some basic Windows stuff, certain software or else, but some basics should be there. Martin had a problem with his monitor turning off and on randomly. As we were a little bit understaffed and had only little to no time to walk to every user's office to analyze, I told him to try a new cable because this solved the problem in the past. He came to us to get a new cable. I gave him one and told him to try it out. Half an hour later, Martin called me. The new cable doesn't work at all. I asked the basic IT question, is the monitor turned on, etc. But none of them seems to be the problem. So I took the time to come to him. He was fiddling around on the back of the monitor complaining about the cable not fitting. Remember those plastic caps on new cables to protect the connector? He tried to plug his new VGA cable in with this cap still on. Severely damaged his monitor with it, ended up with me getting him a new monitor and explaining to him how to plug in cables. He thanked me. Everything was okay. 
Our IT department had a good laugh and things were forgotten shortly after. <clears throat> Something like four months later, Martin called again. One of his USB ports stopped working. I walked directly to his office since I was on my way to another user. Turns out he somehow didn't manage to plug his USB stick in the right way. Basic trial and error everyone has with USB ports at one point, but somehow he managed to push so hard on it that the USB port broke off internally, now just wiggling around. He told me that he even marked the upside on his stick so he doesn't have to fiddle around every time. I don't know if you ever tried to jam a cable or USB stick in with something blocking it from going in, but it takes quite some force. Don't know how this happens on accident. And you can't make this stuff up. ETA, Martin is in his mid-30s, so not some random old guy. I could sort of understand Martin having problems with that little plastic protector on the end of the cable, uh, not realizing that it's there or what it is. I could certainly see that, but if you're trying to plug it in and just a little bit of moderate force doesn't allow it to even remotely go in, something's wrong. You, you know, your brain should tell you stop, call, or ask somebody else for help or, you know, whatever. Don't, don't just keep pushing. And a USB thing, I mean, I don't think I've ever gotten a USB the right direction the first time ever in my life. But I also know that if it doesn't slide right on the first try, flip it around and it goes in then. It's just not that hard. A slight humidity problem and impromptu case mod. Preface, this below is a copy paste of a comment I made on a different subreddit regarding humidity in the server rack. I was told it would fit here too. I had something very similar happening at work once. It was on a survey ship, and we were working in South America at the time, so the AC had to work at 100% power all the time to ensure that the air stayed dry. Yep, the air was dry all right. However, what nobody thought about during AC install was that ships tend to roll, so the condensation buildup didn't always drain where it was supposed to. This system had to always be on for production purposes, so there wasn't really any chances of shutting everything down and dealing with the situation properly. After roughly two years of continuous operation, the water buildup at the bottom of the rack enclosure was so large that water was sloshing back and forth all the time. The enclosure contained four racks, all with computers that somehow survived. However, one of the most critical computers, of course, located at the bottom of one of the racks, was starting to have a disturbing buildup of rust. It still worked, but everybody knew that it could fail at any moment. So we did what we always did, make do with as little downtime as possible. I set up a spare computer, identical in almost every way, and resynced over the contents of the old machine. Luckily, these machines don't change a lot as the data output goes elsewhere. The plan was to swap it during a 15-minute window we had every now and then called line change, and have everything up and running by the time the ship had turned around ready to do the next survey line. There was just one catch. The old machine had a serial interface card of which there was no spares, which meant that I had to take the card out of the old machine and put it into the new one. Everything was planned down to every little detail. Line change came and as soon as one of the navigators called clear, I started powering down the entire production system. While most machines were allowed to do so cleanly, the machine about to be replaced wasn't as lucky. Power cord was yanked from it and everything was unplugged. As I had already loosened the rack screws, getting it out and onto the work desk nearby was done in less than 30 seconds after the clear signal was given. Oh crap, I said to myself as I stood there with the serial interface card in my hand. Remember how I said that the new computer was almost identical? Well, one of the differences was that the new one didn't have a proper riser, so I had to connect the card vertically instead, for which the chassis wasn't tall enough. Are we still okay to start the line? The navigator asked with a nervous expression. I looked at my options and went over in my head what resources I had available on board. Circle once, I declared, which basically meant that I'd have 10 minutes extra. I ran out of the instrument room and down to the mechanics shack where they were drinking coffee knowing they'd be down until the instrument room called and said we were back online. I need a hacksaw, I called out. The chief didn't say anything but looked a bit perplexed, as he knew the rough outline of what I was doing. He walked over to his toolbox and gave it to me. After my way out of the mechanic shack, I heard him yell, Let me know if you need a hammer, too! So back in the instrument room, I started sawing the computer chassis, while the navigator called out estimates for how much time I had left. When I had the thing Frankenstein together and started booting, there was five minutes left. Finished booting at three minutes left. I started to go over the services that had to run for the cluster to work as intended, and you know you're short on time when you hear someone starting to count down in seconds instead. I started the last service and we waited in excitement for this light to turn green on one of the many monitors as the countdown is below 10 seconds. 
go, I said as the light turned green, literally three seconds before start. Everybody's heart rate instantly lowered as soon as we all heard the boom that meant the air guns fired as intended. As far as I know, the AC issue was never fixed, but someone had to enter with a mop every now and then with the glass panes looking like an OP's picture. The new computer worked for as long as I was there. Out of curiosity, I decided to look up the ship on marinetraffic.com just now. Judging by its past sailing tracks, it's still in operation. I seriously hope they fix the issue. It's been well over 10 years since I was on board. I never thought about that. I never thought about computers on ships. I mean, I guess I just always assumed there was a way to keep them dry and cool. Um, yeah. Never thought about what happens to the uh, condensation lines and everything like that, the catch pans and everything on a ship that, like he said, tips and rolls. Uh, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking if there was a catch pan at the bottom for condensation, I would have two or three, at a minimum, drain ports going out and down so that, you know, no matter which way we were pitching, something was going to drain. So, I don't know. Or a pan that went down into a little like a reservoir, like a bucket with a pump that forced it out like a bilge pump. I don't know. Maybe I'm just overthinking things. Where did this person get their information from? This weekend I had possibly the stupidest customer I've ever encountered. So they get through to me asking how to do something on their product that they absolutely cannot do. I tell them this feature is not available on the product they have and this is unacceptable to him. They tell me that they bought this product specifically for the thing it cannot do and they complain that they've been misled about the product. I assume that they've been lied to by an unscrupulous salesman and advise him to get in touch with the retailer. But it turns out they weren't lied to by a salesperson at all. They saw some nonsense on YouTube and just went with that without doing any research of their own. It wasn't even a YouTube video that misinformed him. It was one of the comments on a video of someone reviewing the product. They become extremely irate with me because this is all my fault somehow and start demanding that I tell them where some random commenter on YouTube got their information from. How they would expect me to know something like that is completely beyond me. They stayed on the line with me for over an hour complaining and embarrassing themselves. I can't get over how genuinely stupid this person is. It's a miracle they're even able to work a phone. It took all the restraint I could muster not to tell them to grow a effing brain and stop annoying me. They left me a bad review. I'm sure that'll teach a random guy on YouTube his lesson. If there's one thing I've learned over the years is to take every YouTube uh, how-to video and things like that with a grain of salt. The comments? I don't even read the comments. And if you do see something in a comment on a random YouTube video or something that said in the video itself, verify. You know, Google's a wonderful thing. If you find this being confirmed by some reputable source, great, go for it. Whatever it is, if it's a mod, whatever. But, uh... Yeah, just blindly following one comment on a random video. Yeesh. No 10 button. My keyboard won't work. This happened many years ago to a colleague who was sitting next to me. Hello, this is tech support. How may I help you? Yeah, some of the keys on my keyboard have stopped working. I accidentally dropped a load of biscuit crumbs in there. <laughs> ah, okay, I think we can help with that. Pick up your keyboard and turn it keyside down and tap the far edge gently on top of your desk. He then winces and says, whoa, not that hard. Okay, how is it now? Are the keys free? Can you type with it now? No, now the screen is blank and the computer won't work at all. Eyebrows raised, he asks, what make of computer is it? I see the color drain from his face as she replied, it's an HP laptop. <laughs> he runs to me and mouths, oh crap. P.S. I know it was a stupid thing for him to tell her to do, but he wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. I know, I have one viewer who will tell me how dumb I am for even suggesting this, but I still say powering it down, taking the battery out if it's removable, and uh, using compressed air in the keyboard while tipping it upside down or at least sideways will get a lot of the crumbs out of there. And even with a laptop, you can do a gentle upside down shake and get a lot of stuff out of it. Uh, but you know, I guess there's a few people out there who would never, ever use compressed air on any of their equipment because of moisture that comes out of the can. Of course, I've never had moisture come out. I've seen somebody else have a problem with it when they shook the can for some reason and then sprayed air, but I'll even do it while it's running. I don't care. I'm stupid, whatever, but I do know that it works. Maybe I'm just on borrowed time. 
Playing it safe. So I used to work for a company that sells tech as well as does at-home tech support and installation. One day I was called to an apartment that supposedly had a problem with a router that was purchased just a few days ago. I'm thinking, oh, no problem. It's just an old person who can't set up basic Wi-Fi and router tech. Nevertheless, I made my way to this apartment and find myself surrounded by paper supermarket grocery bags. I'm not kidding. On every surface of the apartment was a paper grocery bag. Walls? Check. Ceiling? Check. Countertops? Check. Toilet seat? Unfortunately, check. The one customer warned me not to open the closet as that's where the leftovers were. I'm so confused. <laughs> I'm so confused as I was also instructed that the router was in the closet. I'm thinking like, what the F? These people are just crazy. Their waste is just absurd. What really can be wrong with their Wi-Fi? I nervously opened the closet to get literally rained on by grocery bags. Not even kidding. I was rained on by grocery bags and the whole closet was just filled with paper and grocery bags. It was insane. I, now frustrated, asked where the router could be. The customer told me it was in the safe and I had to find it. Oh my god, I was actually beside myself. I finally threw enough grocery bags to the side and I found the safe and asked for the code. He pointed at the fridge, which had a smeared expo marker that barely resembled numbers. I tried guessing and eventually threatened giving up and they gave me the code. Finally, this has taken too damn long. I opened the safe to find the routers covered in tinfoil. Like, what? Why? Anyways, I took it out and set it up for them. They kept complaining that I was letting it out of its cage, but I didn't care, just wanted to leave this place. Wrapped it up and could barely say my concluding thoughts and additional steps before I booked it out of there. It doesn't help that my wife is 8 months pregnant and I had to get back to her too. I have enough stress in my life and this wild encounter didn't help. I need a drink. So they had it locked in a safe, which is probably a safe bet that it was made of some kind of metal, and wrapped in tin foil. Was it even set up? Was it plugged in? Were there wires running into the safe? Like, I, it doesn't sound like it from the story, so I'm not sure why they Faraday it like that. And, uh, I don't know. You can't have internet and block your signal. I don't know. There's no point. Just don't get rid of your service. Screw it. Well, I hope you enjoyed this content, and if you did, do me a favor and click this video right here on the screen. I think you're going to enjoy it. See ya.